if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance. Hi, my name is Bob Sutton. I'm the former chief historian of the National Park Service. And it's a great honor for me to be here with you today to talk about a recent book that I published, which is titled Nazis on the Potomac. It's particularly an honor for me to be here because I have tremendous respect for the person who your organization commemorates, General George Catlett Marshall Jr. In fact, I have told a number of people if they'll listen and some who won't listen, that I think he's the greatest American who was not president in our history. And in a lot of ways, I think he's the greatest person in our history, period, including presidents. So this is a big deal for me to be able to speak to you. Now, I really wish that I could meet you in person, talk to you, answer your questions, discuss the topic, discuss everything. But unfortunately, our new reality is that we're not able to do that. So let me start my presentation here. So actually General Marshall had a great deal to do with the beginning of what becomes my story here. When he was chief of staff um, in 1941, he and his, and his advisors decided that the um, intelligence gathering operation of the United States was in an absolutely deplor deplorable condition and they needed to revise it, but instead of trying to do it whole in house, they sent a team over to the university, over to UK, over to Great Britain to study what they were doing in intelligence gathering. The team spent about six months there. They came back in December of 1941, right after Pearl Harbor, and came up with a number of, with a report and a number of recommendations. And among the recommendations were that there should be two detention centers where high-level prisoners from the Pacific Theater and from the Atlantic the Theater should be brought to these centers. And the centers should be run by one agency, in this case, the Army, although the Navy could have a role in interrogating um, um, naval prisoners. The, um, they decided that one of the, one of the sites should be um, in California, either near San Francisco or near, near, near Los Angeles. They settled on a site called, the, which became um, Camp Tracy between Oakland and Stockton uh, in a remote area. It was a, it was, had been a, um, a resort, um, Byron Hot Springs. The woman who owned it um, offered it to the army for $250 a year, in part because her son had been killed uh, in World War I. Um, I don't want to talk a lot about that, um, but it was a, it was the site where most of the Japanese prisoners were brought. In the east, the site that was decided on after going through several different possible options was Fort Hunt, which is on the George Washington Memorial Parkway about halfway between Alexandria and Mount Vernon. And this site was ideal because it it really was underused at the time. It was close to the Pentagon. It was close to the Capitol, but far enough away that it could, was, uh, could be a secret location where uh, no one would be. Now, there were three programs that were, that were recommended to come out of this, uh, to be included at Fort Hunt. Um, they all, of course, they were, our military had to have acronyms. So the first one was Military Intelligence Section Y. And this was a program in which top level, uh, high value German prisoners were brought to Fort Hunt where they were interrogated. And another section also um, listened in on conversations, monitored conversations through an elaborate um, uh, system. The second was military intelligence section X or MIS, MIS X which was escape and evasion. And what, the, what, this, or what this side did was they provided uh, materials for pilots. So if they were shot down, they could hopefully um, evade capture. Um, but if not, if they were sent to POW camps, 
There was an elaborate system to communicate with them, send them materials that would help them either escape or deal with their captivity. And the third was Military Intelligence Research, Sec Research Section, MIRS. And the primary role for this group was to um, uh, translate, interpret, and write reports on um, government, on documents that were captured from the Germans. So the site was Fort Hunt. Um, Fort Hunt actually um, had been around since the beginning of, of the century, since about 1900. This is one of the early pictures of Fort Hunt. Um, it actually was on the site of uh, George Washington's river plantation. So it, it has a history that um, is very significant even to our founding father. Now, one thing that would happen um, with Fort Hunt was that Germans would be brought to the site. Here are some of the Germans who were prisoners who were brought to Fort Hunt. Uh, they generally would be picked up um, at one of the airports, uh, the Washington East military airports, be put on this bus with blacked out windows, and they would be brought to Fort Hunt. Now, the type of people who were the ideal ones for uh, interrogating prisoners, obviously, would be German-speaking people. Even more ideal would be Germans, not only could they speak German, but it was their native language. And third, even more important than that, Jewish Germans, in this case, many who had escaped from, from Nazi Germany or from Austria, come to the United States and they were absolutely perfect for this role um, in several of the programs here at Fort Hunt. Um, let me just give you a, a little snapshot of some of the, some of the folks who came um, from, from Germany. Uh, one was a, a fellow by the name of, of George, um, George Weidinger. George Weidinger uh, went to school one day. Um, his teacher told him he had to go to the office. He went to the office. The office said, you can't go to school anymore. Well, that was kind of a shock, but the reason was even more of a shock. They said, the reason you can't go to school is because you're Jewish. Now, would seem like, okay, that's fine. I'm Jewish, I can't, I, I understand that. But what happened was his parents had converted to Christianity. He didn't know that. So this was a double shock. First of all, he couldn't go to school. And second of all, his parents um, had converted from, um, from, Ju from Christ Judaism to Christianity. And so he was, he was um, in sort of a no man's land. Eventually he and his family were able to um, immigrate to the United States. His father had been a, an executive with a, an American paint company uh, from Cleveland. Um, but when they came to the United States, uh, they, they didn't have anything really. Um, and his father was able to get a job as a stock a stockman in a, in a building supply company, which was about five or six layers below what he had done in Germany. But according to George Weidinger, his father was the happiest man in the world because he was able to immigrate to the United States. The second person is the picture you see here on the left, the boy um, with the blondish hair sitting on the, to the right of his mother was a fellow by the name of Rudy Pins. <laughs> now, when I look at this picture, I just realize this looks like they've been wearing face masks for a while with their ears. Anyway, I'm sorry, I had to throw it in there. Anyway, Rudy Pins um, was raised in Germany. Um, when he was a young boy, he was the only, one, uh, the only Jewish boy really in his community. But it didn't really matter because he had a lot of friends who were both Jewish and um, non-Jewish. Um, and he, uh, you know, there was really no prejudice that he could see. But when Hitler came to power, um, things began to get kind of rough. His, his parents discovered a program that allowed a thousand Jewish children from Germany to immigrate to the United States. And they could stay with, with either family members or with foster families. They applied for Rudy to be part of this program. He was accepted. He was sent to the United States. Uh, the picture you see on the right was a, a number of kids who were from Austria um, who came to the United States as well um, under this program. Now, his parents were willing to do this because they thought, as did many Germans at the time, especially German Jews, they thought that Hitler was an aberration, that the Nazis would only be in po power for a short time everything would return to normal, their children could come home and everybody would be happy. Well, of course we know that didn't actually happen. Another person, um, Paul 
Schoenbach um, was lived in Germany as well. And when he was young, when he was 10 years old, like the others, he was told he couldn't go to school. Um, his father was a banker, was a very successful banker um, in Germany. Well, he was so disgusted with this. He said, we're not living here anymore. Packed up the family and moved to Palestine. His father had some businesses in Palestine. They were not really successful. Um, and eventually they, they uh, went to uh, the Netherlands and they decided they wanted to immigrate to the United States, but they had pretty much used up all their resources. Um, so the father turned out to be a very good salesman. He went to the immigration officer to see if they could immigrate to the United States. He said, well, what are you gonna use for money? He says, well, I have a stamp collection that's worth quite a bit. And he says, yeah, right. Well, anyway, he pulled out a, he pulled out a catalog and showed a, a non-canceled original uh, um, stamp of the Hindenburg uh, dirigible um, accident and showed that it was worth over a thousand dollars. They said, okay, fine, you can go to the United States. When they came to the United States, the father decided to change their name from Schoenbach, which in, in German meant Fairbrook to Fairbrook. So now this young fellow became Paul Fairbrook. Another young man, Werner Moritz, um, as a teenager, was able to immigrate to England. Uh, his mother was English. He was able to immigrate to England. He came back to Germany in November of 1938. He came there with the intention of joining his family, and the whole family was going to immigrate to the United States. What happened in November of 1938, in fact, November 8th and 9th of November, uh, 1938, was something was called Kristallnacht, which meant the breaking of glass, in which Jewish businesses, synagogues, houses all over Germany were destroyed by uh, Nazis. So he got caught in that. He was sent to a concentration camp um, for a month. He did not know why. He also did not know why he was released. He came back, he found out that he could emigrate, but his family could not. So he emigrated to England and then to the United States. When he got to the United States as a teenager, he had virtually pennies in his pocket, but he was able to work in this program as well. Now, these, all of these um, folks who worked at, at Fort Hunt, um, no one really knew anything about intelligence. And so they had to go to a place to learn to, to, be, to be trained in intelligence gathering. And the place they were sent to was a place called Camp Ritchie, which is near present day um, Camp David in the Catoctin Mountains of Maryland, not far from Gettysburg as well. Um, there you possibly saw um, on 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago, there was a, an hour long program on the Ritchie boys, all these fellows who were trained at uh, Camp Ritchie. Well, many of the folks who were at Fort Hunt were trained there as well. The training was very comprehensive. In fact, if you would have stumbled on Camp Ritchie in, let's say the 1940s, you might've thought you stumbled into a German cell, a Nazi shell cell, cell in Maryland because most of the people there were dressed up in German uniforms. They rode around in German half tracks. Um, there, it really looked like sort of a sort of a, a sample of, of Germany. In fact, one of the soldiers who went there for training, um, he said that he had been riding on a train for a long time. He was starving. He got there. He went into the mess hall, sat down, looked around, and realized that every single person there except him looked like a German soldier. Um, and so it was, a, it was a, a training center that tried to focus on everything conceivable that people might encounter in, in Europe if they were sent there, most of them were, or if they were sent to Fort Hunt, the other thing that they were trained to do was to interrogate German prisoners. So the fellow you, the fellows you see here on the right, the one sitting at the desk is a trainee, the fellow standing up is a German trainee, is a German uh, impersonator actually an American, and they would do everything they could to try to, to try to trick the interrogators. So they'd go through an extensive training process. Some of them succeeded, about 40% didn't, and they were uh, washed out of the program. So it was a very intensive program that lasted for several weeks or months for, for many of the people who 
uh, ended up at Fort Hunt. Well, Fort Hunt itself, um, now it was not referred to as Fort Hunt anymore. It was referred to as Post Office Box 1142. And the what needed to be done immediately was to build a, um, a prison compound for the, for the Germans that would be brought in. And they needed to do it quickly because the uh, military said that, that they, were, they had captured a U-boat. They were gonna bring the prisoners here um, to interrogate. So the army hired one of, its, one of its engineers to build the prison compound. They said, you have eight weeks to do it. He actually did it in six weeks, which is absolutely remarkable. Uh, this is the one on the left here in this image. Um, but things were happening at break spec, breakneck speed at that time anyway. The Pentagon, which is still, I believe, the largest uh, building for square footage in the country, if not the world, was built in 18 months. So six, six weeks for this is not, was not unusual. Later, another compound, um, uh, Enclosure B, was added uh, several years later, which you see on the, on the right here. Now, what they did, they tried to make this comfortable for prisoners. So instead of like a cell block, uh, they actually lived in like dorm rooms, uh, which you can see here. But one of the things that was really important with this program was intelligent, was a, a monitoring system. And so they had microphones, like you see here on the left, all over the fort in rooms, in the, in the individual rooms, different um, public areas of the fort. So there was an opportunity to monitor what was going on throughout the port. Um, this, is the, this is where they would type up the reports here on the left. On the right, this is a monitoring station. So they would, they would someone would be sitting there, they would listen in um, on conversations around the fort. And if they thought something was important, they would record it. And what you see on the left is the recording machine. It actually looks like a record player. This is pre-tape. Um, uh, they didn't, did not even at that time have real to reel tapes, and so they recorded on a machine that looked like a mimeograph um, at uh, Fort Hunt. Now, they had a lot of success um, interrogating prisoners. Many of them were willing to answer questions. Uh, they had a, a system where they said, you know, um, if you are you comfortable uh, where you are? Um, would you like a cigarette? Um, do you enjoy playing the, the games we have? They had ping pong, they had horseshoes, they had soccer, they had every kind of game there was. They fed them well. Uh, they tried to take very good care of the people there. If they answered questions, they would take them into town to see a movie or take them to a, um, a nice dinner. Um, that, was, that was the way they dealt with it. Um, but there were some prisoners who were not anxious to answer questions, and they had several ways of dealing with it. Now, there's one thing that I have in my book, say it over and over and over again, very important, and it's very important um, that to, to recognize this, they said, anybody who was there said the one thing we did not do ever was torture, beat, do anything in the way of corporal punishment to any of the pres prisoners ever. And they wanted to make that very clear to me, make it very clear um, that this is how they operated. But if someone didn't answer, they had other ways of dealing with it. So for one thing, they would take some prisoners down, they would lock them in a, um, there was an underground um, bunker that they would lock them in for a day. Uh, sometimes that would soften them up, sometimes it wouldn't. But the thing that worked better than anything else, without question, was they had two um, uh, Russian American soldiers, Alexander Shedlinsky and Alexander Dallin, who dressed up in Red Army uniforms, sort of like this. They were around the fort all the time. So let's say someone didn't want to answer the question. Well, they would say, okay, that's fine. You don't want to answer the question. How about Ivan here takes you to the Soviet Union? Maybe they would like to hear what you have to say. And that worked remarkably well, both at Fort Hunt and in the European theater where they interrogated prisoners as well. And so short of actually uh, torturing anybody, that worked exceedingly well. Now, there were some very, very famous um, people who came through um, Fort Hunt. And um, probably one of the most famous was um, a prisoner 
by the name of um, Hiroshi um, uh, Oshima. Now he um, had been very close to Hitler, as you can see here. He was the, the one of the principal um, Japanese um, attaches and ambassadors to Germany. He was very close to Hitler. Hitler told him a lot of the things that were going on um, with the program in in um, in Germany. Um, Oshima actually was brought to Fort Hunt, spent several several months there being interrogated. Now, what he didn't know, and what the Germans didn't know, was that he um, was sending information to Japan as soon as he got it from Hitler, but the United States had broken the Japanese code, and in many cases, the Americans knew what Oshima was sending to Japan before the Japanese knew. In fact, um, General Marshall said of Oshima, he said, Oshima was our main basis of information regarding Hitler's intentions in Europe. So he was an incredibly valuable asset and he didn't even know it. Um, now he came uh, to Fort Hunt after um, the war was over and that was important, but he was, he was a very, very important part of, of uh, what happened, of, of the success of the American intelligence gathering operation. Now, another part of the program was, was listening in on conversations. And um, what would happen here was that, um, uh, the, you know, the microphones that were all over the, all over the fort would, would kept, capture conversations between Germans. Um, in some cases, that they would interrogate a German. He would go back to his room, talk to his roommate. Uh, the roommate might say something like, oh, you know, what did they ask you today? Well, they asked me about such and such. Well, what'd you tell them? Well, you know, I was kind of cagey. I didn't really tell them the, the whole story about it. I, I, you know, didn't want them to know, blah, blah. Well, if they were lucky, they'd say, oh, you mean you didn't tell them about the certain, the certain doodad on the Humahama? And he'd say, no, I didn't tell them that. But if they weren't lucky and they wouldn't say that, they might follow up with, with another prisoner and try to find out exactly what the situation situation was. So that worked sometimes, sometimes it didn't. The most successful thing about the um, uh, monitoring program, though, was that the Americans recruited Germans who were disgruntled with the Nazi regime, and they were willing to work for the Americans. They recruited them to be what was called stool pigeons or SPs. They were German, they would room with German, with what they thought were high value German prisoners. Um, they would sometimes get information from them. Sometimes they get them to give the information over the, um, the um, monitoring system. In some cases, they would talk to them in the, like in the, out in the athletic field um, where they knew that there weren't any microphones. And that turned out to be an enormously successful program. Um, but uh, most of the, the most success they had was gathering information through the um, the, the uh, interrogation system. Another program at Fort Hunt was um, the uh, military intelligence research section, and this was made up of 19 men. Again, most of them were German Jews um, who had come to the United States as the ones that I had mentioned. Now, one problem that, that they had early on, some of them, this fellow here on the right, Paul um, Fairbrook, who's still alive, he's become a very good friend, very helpful to me on this project. Paul said uh, that one of the problems was that he, he immediately wanted to join the army, or actually wanted to join the Marines, but he couldn't, and most of, the, most of his fellow Germans couldn't as well, because at the beginning they were classified as en enemy aliens. What did this mean? Well, it didn't mean that they were necessarily enemy or they weren't, they were aliens. But what it meant is that the countries of which they were citizens of were in war against the United States. This is an international uh, designation. Eventually, of course, many of them were able to uh, join the United States, the army or the, or the uh, different branches of the service, um, in part because the Germans had decided that Jews were no longer citizens of Germany. So now they were not citizens, and so they could become citizens of the United States. Well, the MIRS system translated documents. Now, to give you a sense of how many documents there were, 
Um, there were, um, we actually have a pretty good, pretty good documentation of how many there were. There were eventually 5,374 mail, mail bags of documents weighing a total of over 150 tons. So you can see here, and Paul Fairbrook actually helped the artist uh, do this image here on the left. Paul is, you can see the fellow standing over him um, on the left. Um, so they had someone to bring in the mailbag. They would parcel out documents and each one had a specialty. So one might be, um, his specialty might be the high command, another specialty might be the, um, the Gestapo, another might have a specialty of German youth and so forth. So they'd parcel out the documents the men would, would translate and then determine what was significant about the document or what was significant. Now, the, um, uh, the German, the, the Paul Fairbrook had a really nice quote about this. He said that the, um, the Germans, um, every time someone would sneeze, they would document it. Uh, they were fastidious document keepers. And so it was very helpful to them to fight a war but it became probably even more helpful to the Americans as they had captured and translated these documents as well. So they would take the information and they'd put it into publications. And by far the most significant publication that they published was the one on the left, The Order of Battle of the German Army or what was called the Red Book. Why was it called the Red Book? Because it had a red cover. This source would docu documented every every division in the German army. Uh, it would focus on who the commander was, where they had been, where they were, um, what their specialty was. Uh, there would be a whole, there's a whole fairly long section on the SS, what they were, what they did. Um, they found more and more about them and how disgusting parts of the SS was, the Gestapo was. Um, it documented virtually everything, and it became a Bible uh, in part for the for the um, invasion on D-Day because it documented all the different German um, sections that were in both Belgium and France at the time. Uh, so it was enormously helpful for that, but it also was helpful for interrogators because they could. Um, they could say, you know, I know about your division. I know who your commander is. I know where you were. I know what you did, blah, 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 blah. Well, what would happen was that the, the person would sit there, his eyes would, would be wide and he'd say, how on earth do you know that? Uh, say, well, we know everything. And so some of them would just decide, well, you know, they already know it, so I might as well tell them what they want to know. So it could be enormously helpful in a number of different ways. And this um, was, was a very significant publication that came out of MIRS. There, there were other ones as well, like German terms, you know, what were German terms, how significant were they, and so forth. But they also could use the, um, they could also use information that they gathered. One thing that they found enormously helpful were what was called a, a German passbook, and I can't remember exactly the German term for it, but essentially it was like a passport. Each German had one, it documented everything about his service, where he had been, the sorts of, um, if he had gotten a medal, what medal he would get, um, who his commander was, was he reprimanded? Everything about a particular soldier was in this passbook and cumulatively they had a tremendous value as well. Another thing that was very helpful was um, the Germans had an official um, brothel system. They had brothels all over. The, the men were encouraged to use the brothels, but they were also required to carry a card that said where they had been and who they had been with at the brothel. Um, this was for the Germans. The purpose was if there was a disease that showed up, um, they could deal with it uh, immediately. But for the Americans, it turned out to be very valuable as well, because let's say a soldier had this card uh, they decided, well, you know, I don't know if he, if he knows that we know this, we know about his, what happened. Maybe the soldier was married, maybe he was religious, didn't matter. If they brought the brothel up, sometimes they would just start, they would start talking nonstop because they felt so guilty about going to the brothel. Um, one of the men who was at, at um, Fort Hunt in the MIRS, 
MIRS program. There's a man by the name of John Kluge. John Kluge uh, eventually became the richest man in the United States. In the 1980s, he owned a company called Metro Media, which he sold for several billion dollars. But he was at Fort Hunt and he was in charge of the MIRS system. And he's told a lot of ways how some of the documents that were captured could be used for interrogations as well. So for example, um, one of the soldiers in MIRS found a, a newspaper, an obscure news, newspaper from Germany that showed the wedding of um, Edwin Rommel's daughter. And in the picture were several generals. Well, it turned out one of the generals happened to be at Fort Hunt. So they went to him and said, you know, we know that you were at, at uh, Rommel's wedding. Well, how'd you know that? Well, you know, we've got people all over. We know that. We also know that you were talking to General So-and-so, which was next to you. And he just was completely shocked. How did they know that? Well, of course, they knew it from the newspaper, but they weren't going to say that. They also had the um, uh, phone book from the Reichstag. And they could say, well, we know you called so-and-so and you called so-and-so. And well, how do you know that? Well, we've tapped every single phone in the Reichstag and that's how we know that. So they could use documents um, for that bit reason as well. And Kluge had a, had a good sense of humor. And one of my favorite stories is he said that um, uh, one day he was driving a general around and um, he was driving by the Pentagon. And he said, oh, there's the Pentagon. He said, oh, no, no, wait a minute. That's not the Pentagon. Actually, that's the annex. The Pentag Pentagon is underground and it's much bigger. So he had fun with um, some of the Germans as well. So the other section, of Fort Hunt was MISX or the escape and evasion section. And so of course the main thing was to try to avoid being captured. Um, this, the uh, soldiers, the, the airmen um, would carry in their flight, in their flights, uh, you know, flights, uh, I guess, whatever you call it, flight suit, flight suit, there we go, flight suit. They would carry an escape package and it would have things like uh, pills to um, to purify water, would have a saw, would have a map of the area, would have a compass, um, would have money. Uh, so that was sort of the standard um, uh, evasion kit. But some would also carry what's called a barter kit, which you see here. The one on the left was for the Atlantic Theater. The one on the right was for the Pacific Theater. It had gold coins and gold rings that sometimes you could use, a soldier could use to um, try to get either information or get food from somebody um, by offering this as well. So part of it was trying to evade capture, but if they were captured, sent to a POW camp, there were ways of dealing with that as well. And one thing they would do is they would send letters. They would send coded letters to the camp. Every camp would have at least one person, usually more than one, who could decode all the letters that were sent. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and they would tell about some of the things that would be sent to them. So for example, <coughs> excuse me, um, there was a, they would um, hide things like transmitters in cribbage boards, which you see here. They had transmitters in baseballs. <laughs> they would put maps in playing cards. They would put money in game boards and so forth. They would send a letter and say, a package is coming from this dummy organization. It would usually take a couple of months to get there. But when it came, they were on alert to look out for the package and <clears throat> try to keep it away from the German um, guards. And inside would be different things that would either help them deal with their captivity or in some cases help them escape. Uh, and so this was another very important part of, um, of Fort Hunt. Now, <clears throat> they worked hard. All the men that were, were at Fort Hunt worked hard, but it didn't mean that they, that they, it was all work and no play. So one weekend, one of the soldiers who was, two of the soldiers who were stationed at Fort Hunt, fellow by the name of Arno Mayer and his buddy, Leslie Wilson, we're planning to go to New York. Um, Mayor was from New York. He'd lined up a couple of hot dates for them. Uh, they decided they wanted to go to New York. And so they, <clears throat> they missed the bus that went to Union Station. Uh, they went out on the Memorial Parkway. It was pouring rain to hitchhike. So a car comes along, picks them up, 
takes them to Union Station. On the way, they have, they're sort of having fun with the women in the car. One of them says, "What? ask um, Arno Mayer, what do you have in that box? A little black box. He said, oh, it's a nuclear bomb. And he said, no, it's not. Well, they went back and forth and back and forth. Of course, they knew it wasn't a nuclear bomb. This is actually, let me, let me just set the record straight here. This is after World War II was over. Uh, the Fort, uh, the National Park Service owned um, Fort Hunt. Uh, the Army had it under a, a special agreement, and the agreement was that it would last through the war plus one year. So this is after the war. Uh, there were prisoners that were brought in um, after the war as well. So this is after the war, and so they're, they're in the car, they get to Union Station, they get on a train, and they start comparing notes, and they say, um, do you know what General Eisenhower's wife's name is? Said no, but the woman that was sitting in the middle, they kept referring to her as Mamie, and others kept referring to her husband as General Eisenhower. Now, General Eisenhower at the time, um, was after the war, was now Chief of Staff of the Army. <clears throat> anyway, so they get to New York, they find out that Mamie, the Mamie definitely is Mamie Eisenhower. They decide, you know, we probably should send a note to her and thank her for picking us up. So they did. They sent a note to her in care of General Eisenhower at the Pentagon. Well, a few days later, the commanding officer calls them into his office. They think they're in big trouble for who knows what, for, for um, hitchhiking, which, which they really weren't supposed to do for teasing these women about having a nuclear bomb, which was not good either, um, or who knows what. But anyway, they were they thought they were in big trouble. They walked in the commanding officer's office and he almost started to bow to them. He said, uh, we have a letter here, which you should open from General Eisenhower. And so they opened the letter and this is the letter that they received. <clears throat> and if, if you can't read it, it's that's fine. But essentially it says, thank you so much for writing to Mrs. Eisenhower. She's been very busy and not feeling well lately. So she asked me to respond to you and your letter. Um, we appreciate you, we appreciate what you do. We always like to pick up soldiers because we always learn from them. Um, signed Dwight D. Eisenhower. Now, the, the interesting thing is that we, uh, the, the two men, um, Arno Mayer and Leslie Wilson, one kept the envelope, the other kept the letter, and they donated them to the National Park Service. So we now have them in our collection. But that's, I think, one of the most interesting stories um, that we have um, of Fort Hunt. Well, let me shift gears here a little bit and tell you a little bit more about this project, about, about the uh, book that I've written. And a lot of it has to do with the National Park Service. As I mentioned, uh, Fort Hunt is part of National Parks. And what happened was in around 2000, um, the, the park Fort Hunt started learning about what was happening here during World War II. They learned that there was a top secret operation that took place here. They didn't know a great deal about it, but as documents from World War II were being declassified, they learned more and more about it. But what they really wanted to find out was if they could interview anybody who had been stationed here during uh, World War II. Now they would give, they would give tours of the fort um, on a fairly regular basis. And one day in 2005, a ranger um, gave it, was giving a tour and she he went through the whole history of the fort, what had happened there. And at the end, she said, you know, we're beginning to learn about what happened here during World War II. It's a really fascinating story and what we're trying to also do is find out um, if anybody knows anybody who was stationed here during that time. The ranger was, her name was Dana Dirks. She told her supervisor, the gentleman here on the left, Vince, Vincent Santusi, um, that uh, someone in the group had said, yeah, my neighbor um, was actually at Fort Hunt um, during World War II. Um, he's still alive. Um, you might want to talk to him. So she gave um, gave Dana her the information. Um, Vince Santusi gave it to the historian who's on the right, Brendan Beese, and or, excuse me, Brendan Bice. And Brendan contacted this gentleman whose name was Fred Michelle, who had moved to Lexington, Kentucky. Um, he was able to meet with him. 
um, he was very reluctant to give any information. Now, one of the things that happened after World War II or during World War II, the men who were stationed at Fort Hunt were sworn to secrecy and many of them uh, believed, um, as they were told by the army, that they were going to take the story um, to the, of, the, of their time there to the grave, and many already had. Well, Brandon kind of got a sense that, that Fred Michelle was very reluctant to talk, so he actually was able to find some of the interviews that he had conducted. He was in the um, interrogation program. He brought them along with him, showed his name on them, showed that they were signed. So now he was willing to talk, and he started giving us names of um, soldiers who were stationed there, and we began to recruit, find people who were stationed there. And by the time the project was finished, uh, we were able to we were able to interview about 65 of the soldiers who were stationed at Fort Hunt. In some cases, we even talked to some of the prisoners who were there. <clears throat> and so that became the basis of this book that I've just published, um, Nazis on the Potomac. Um, this picture was taken in 2007. In 2007, the park and the army had a um, had had a reunion at Fort Hunt, where they brought all of these um, as many men as they could um, to the site. Uh, you can see that not all 65 are here. Unfortunately, now most of them are gone. Um, but this was a wonderful opportunity. For for them all to come together to share their stories about what had happened when they were at Fort Hunt. Now they all received awards um, from the army um, for their work there. Some of them got up and gave speeches and several of them made a point of saying that they, when they were dealing with the Nazis at Fort Hunt, they did not, they did not torture or beat any of the prisoners there. Of course, the reason for that was at the time um, it was very clear what the uh, American military was doing in the Middle East, uh, especially in Iraq, um, Abu Ghraib, and so forth, torturing prisoners on a regular basis. They wanted to make it very clear that they did not do that at Fort Hunt. Very important. Well, what, was, what is the importance of, of Fort Hunt? Why is this important um, to us? What is important um, about from World War II? And I think there's several things. First of all, um, a lot of scholars think that the intelligence gathering that the Allies did um, during World War II probably cut the length of the war by about two years. In other words, it ended probably two years earlier than it could have otherwise, primarily because of the intelligence gathering operation. Um, another scholar says that by the end of the war, um, Eisenhower, because of the intelligence gathering, Eisenhower probably knew more about uh, what was going on with the German army than Hitler did. Now, of course, there's kind of a problem with that because, um, <clears throat> you know, Hitler, the Americans didn't know very much about the Battle of the Bulge, what was going to happen there. Um, actually, some of the, some of the um, German Jew American soldiers who were interrogating prisoners in Germany tried to warn them that something was going to happen, um, but of course they didn't. But anyway, it certainly had an impact. Um, and exactly how, what happened, how important uh, Fort Hunt was in this, we don't, it's hard to say, but it certainly was contributing um, to ending the war sooner. But I think what's really important is to look at what the men stationed at Fort Hunt had to say about their service there and their service to the United States during World War II. Um, I've mentioned Paul Fairbrook several times in this talk. Um, I've actually gotten to know him. Um, he's a wonderful man. He's um, close to 100 years old, still as sharp as can be. Um, he was um, on the program on Camp Ritchie. He was at Camp Ritchie, uh, was part of the program at Camp Ritchie. Um, he's had a, a wonderful life. And a couple months ago, someone was asking him, about why he thought his service in, in World War II was important. And this is what he said. Paul, Paul Fairbrook said, I was able to revenge in whatever way I could my loss of my uncle, my aunt, and my cousins, my family to the Holocaust. I had a chance to really do something about that. Second, and equally important, 
I had the chance to thank the United States for letting me and my family in. Because of that, I, my children, and my grandchildren are all doing well in this wonderful country. So that's what he had to say. And what I have to say is thank you so much for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned something. And I hope at one time, at some point, we can all get together in person. Thank you so much.